So I first um, started doing gang research not because I was related or even interested in gangs. It was really funny. I wasn't interested in gangs at all, actually. I had zero interest in crime or deviance or drug use. I didn't really have that in my mind. I was very interested in art history, and I was interested in th really pulling out strong links between art and society. And I wondered where on earth these links were in our society. So I was really interested in the art of the Northwest Coast, um, you know, the people who, you know, indigenous groups who are doing a lot of work around clan representation, you know, most famously totem poles and things like that. I was interested in early Christian art, so I did a lot of... Um, I, I was just delving into it sort of in a global way and asking myself the question of where that linkage existed in our society, and I accidentally found it in gang graffiti. And so, and in specific, it was Chicano gang graffiti at the time. Um, I, I had a wonderful experience writing my first book, um, and many of the questions that you guys asked me about fearing for my life and did I ever have times when I was scared and things of that nature um, were more true for that first book because I was putting myself out there on the street a lot. I was walking around in neighborhoods. I was really young. I didn't know that much. I was from the suburbs. I didn't really get you know, inner city life, but I ended up developing a certain amount of, you know, what people call street smarts. You know, I'm still kind of the the person who runs um, by trust, and um, that has, I think, touches on some of your questions as well, um, and, and it certainly allowed me to write both of these books. So the backstory on on Flytrap partly has to do with my first book, which is Wallbangin', because one of the people that I met in the course of doing the research for that book um, was someone who was targeted um, in Operation Flytrap. And he, for me, was was my, you know, my 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 main person, my my key informant. And I write about him in the introduction. His name is Ben, and um, he I became very close with his family. And the thing that quickly happened to me in the course of doing this work is that, you know, you don't have the luxury of studying art um, when there's such really grave um, problems that you're confronting that have to do with social inequality and violence. And... I had not started out interested in gangs at all or interested in drugs, but I became very interested in those things simply because that was the context in which the the artistic aspects of the society that I was studying, which was gangs, that was the context in which those things were operating. And so um, when Paul and I met here at Pitzer um, last semester, it was really funny because he said, you know, are you sure you're ready to give up that visual stuff? And I was like, you know, I've completely played it out, you know, that I, I did that for 15 years of my life or whatever it was in different ways, studying gang tattoos, studying graffiti, studying tattoo removal, studying gang dancing. I mean, I had all these different ways of going in and out of that. And what I ended up realizing was that I... I wanted to do more, um, more along the lines of what one of you asked me, um, which is what can people do, you know, um, trying to find who, um, you know, what, what can we as citizens do, it was Melanie's question, um, to influence changes in the legal system. And I got to a point in my research where it was no longer satisfying for me just to study art anymore um, because there was some kind of an exoticizing that I never really could get beyond um, with that. And, um, and, then, and that led me to, um, to delve more into these policy issues. Um, 
there's a way that my work on art and in particular tattooing, this is a little side note, uh, plays into um, legal reforms because there are people who are getting deported or who, I'm sorry, who are being denied re-entry into the United States on the basis of their tattoos. They're, they're, they're being designated as gang members because of certain tattoos that they have and people who would have otherwise been able to return to the United States who don't have criminal records, they're not in gang files, etc. The Department of State issues these decrees that, you know, if you have the words brown pride on your body, it means you're a gang member. Um, now, many people have the words brown pride on them, and that doesn't mean that, or they'll put the smile now, cry later faces, or different things that have even entered popular culture. And um, they, they're they denied reentry, so that I've been able to sort of use some of my, what might have been considered like this sort of like fascination with with tattoos and my, my, my long-standing experience studying them, um, to hopefully impact people um, in a positive way. None of the cases I've been involved with have been successful, but there are um, larger scale legal challenges going on regarding that that I hope to become involved with. Um, that's a little bit of a side note. The, um, the backstory, back to the backstory on Flytrap, um, a lot of you guys were interested in like what it was like to do the research and if people trusted me, um, Kira talked about, you know, were there cooperation of participants and did it change my opinion of what was going on? And Nate asked, did what was how difficult was it to get some version of the truth, you know, from officers and other participants? Um, you know, Kristen and a couple of other people, Jake, I think, asked was my life, did I ever perceive my life to be in danger? Were there scary field experiences? Um, and then Jessica and Zoe wanted to know about some challenges, struggles to gather information in the book and the reluctance of people to cooperate. Um, and Sadie, I think, asked a similar question. How did I get people to cooperate? And it was interesting. And, and this also feeds into a number of your of your questions that you guys asked me about the differences between working with the law enforcement side and working with the gang member side. And from a popular perspective, anybody would think, well, it's going to be way easier to work with cops than it is going to be to work with criminals because it's harder to break into those communities and police are to some degree public figures and how do you even gain access to gang worlds, etc. For me, it was totally the opposite, um, which is that I did not have any experience with police. Um, I... Um, you know, I had a lot of gang connections, um, and, but I didn't have connections with the police. In fact, the character of Mark Brooks in the, in the book, it took me ye literally years. So this book, uh, took me about, t uh, nine years or so, um, of research and writing to do and there's reasons why it took me so long that have to do with the fact that I like had two babies and uh it was really hard for me to write to find the time to write I have a full-time job that is administrative partially and I don't have the time off in the summers that people have to write and stuff so it took me forever to do it just for logistical reasons and I started to become very grateful actually to um to my kids for having extended the process because what I realized was that the longer it took me, the better it was getting because of the wisdom th that came with time and with the time that I put into this. And one of the pieces of wisdom was that I needed to talk to Mark Brooks and it took me forever to get there because I had known about Mark Brooks for long for a long time for years like maybe five or six years I had listened to everybody in the neighborhood just say he was the worst individual he was a liar you know they just all these things that they would say about him like never talk to him you know he's like the worst kind of cop ever and I actually tried to talk to everybody but him in the case like I I called the LAPD and I asked for people, but I didn't ask for him. I got an interview with an LAPD guy who doesn't even appear in the book, but it was clear to me he was on the periphery of the case. Um, and then one day I realized 
I got to call Mark Brooks, you know, like, why am I not calling this dude? Um, and I, and I tried to get a hold of him and he was incredibly reluctant to talk to me. He did not want to talk to me. He, 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 for 99% of the time I was working on the book, he said, Susan, you don't know what you're talking about. Every time we would have a conversation, he would be like, you have no idea what thing, what life is like down there. You know, I know what's going on. You don't have any clue. And he, and he had that attitude with me for, I would say a good solid year before he agreed uh, to talk to me. Now the, the formal part of the holdup with working with police is that the formal legal, they have to have a formal permissions process through their respective bureaucracies. So in the case of Mark Brooks, the LAPD had to okay the interviews. And in fact, they, there was no problem. They did it almost immediately. Um, the problem was the, the U.S. attorney, one of the assistant U.S. attorneys in the case, Jennifer Corbett, who was someone I did not interview. And she was the person who became for me like Mark Brooks was for the gang members, just like the worst type. And this is totally just between us. She was, uh, she was just horrible to me. She basically was convinced I was going to write a liberal book that would not hear the other side of the issue, that wouldn't represent the voices of law enforcement fairly. Um, and she basically killed my project from a law enforcement side for an extremely long period of time, some somewhere about a, a year. Um, I couldn't get interviews with people, even though the LAPD had agreed um, to let Mark Brooks interview me, the department, the, the, um, the Department of Justice was saying no. So they, so, so the U S attorneys said, no, we cannot do this. These people are still in appeals. There might be something that she uncovers in the course of doing this work that, um, um, that doesn't allow, uh, that, that will influence the outcome of the cases. And it even got to the point where the FBI had even approved my ability to interview Rob King. And I had bought a ticket to Texas to fly to Texas where Rob King was subsequently stationed. We were going to do the interview there. It was all set up with the media relations person. And when you interview the FBI, if you interview field agents or whatever, they have to have a media relations person like sitting in the room with you. They, they can't let you alone to do your field work with them. And uh, the day before I was about to get on the plane, uh, Corbett just canceled the entire thing and said no. She had called the field agency and said, we can't allow this interview to take place. So it was extremely frustrating for me. Um, <laughs> and she, and I, you know, to, to, to be fair, I did not, I really tried to prove her wrong in this book. And part of her hostility toward me was what made me more determined than ever to represent both sides of this issue as fairly and accurately as possible um, so that I could say honestly to her, you know, I didn't write a quote unquote liberal book. Now, the interesting thing is I may have actually written a liberal book. I mean, I have all kinds of critiques of, of the U.S. justice system. But what's different about my book is that, and I never promised to anyone that I would, that I would, um, do that I would not have critiques. Everybody knew that I had critiques. The FBI guy knew and the LAPD guy knew. Everybody knew. I never made a secret of it. And they knew, in a sense, that their role was to provide balance and counter arguments for some of the things that, that I was writing. Um, and they, they ended up getting on board with the project. The guy who really set the tone for it was Rob King, the FBI agent. And he... Um, he was, he, he was, to his credit, just fantastic with me. He knew that I had a completely opposite political opinion as he did on most any subject that would come down the pike, including the very job that he does and did. Um, but he also recognized that without his voice and without the voice of Mark Brooks, that my book would have been incredibly biased and it would have been biased against them. And that was the funny thing about Jennifer Corbett. If she had, that she almost cemented the fact that I was going to write a biased book by disallowing me from getting the other side uh, of the issue. 
Um, it was a really exciting day for me when I first talked to Mark Brooks. I had an infant in my arms. My little girl, Catherine, had been born and I was on maternity leave. And it was just so strange, the, you know, having th these babies and trying to do field work at the same time. And, um, you know, I used to do a lot of field work with Mark over the phone because he had these really long commutes from Riverside and he would call me. Um, and that was after, like I said, about a year he decided, okay, we met in person in LA um, for lunch one day. And he proceeded once again to tell me I had no fucking clue what I was talking about. Although I did know a lot of people, you know, in the neighborhood and he knew some of the people that I knew, etc. cetera. Um, once he decided to get on board with a project, um, the very first day that I talked to him on the phone, even before we met in person, I hung up with him and two minutes later, I got a phone call and it was, um, it was Rob King from the FBI and I was completely floored because I had tried to call the FBI, the Los Angeles field office to say, I'm looking for this particular, um, special agent, Rob King. And can you like give him a message from me to call me? And they said, no, you know, these are very, you know, it's not, re we can't reveal where he's now stationed. And I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to get a hold of this guy. So it was really exciting because of course, Mark and Rob are really good friends and they talk to each other all the time. They have their cell phone numbers in their phone, which of course now I have their cell phone numbers in my phone. Um, but they, that was sort of the beginning of it all. And that was when, um, that was in 2009. So it wasn't that long ago that all the FBI stuff and everything ended up getting wound into um, into the book. Um, I, I count myself incredibly lucky that, that that was the case. Now, some of you guys asked me questions specifically about um, the, the police and working with them. Um, you know, did, did I feel they were biased? Um, did I, Zoe asked, do, did you receive any reluctance to cooperate? Um, there were other questions from others of you guys who were talking about, um, oh, Nate again, did you have difficulty trying to get to the truth because they wanted to save face for themselves? It turned out in this case, there was really not a lot to save face from. Like this wasn't a case about corruption or anything. This was a really straightforward case where the cops, you know, for the most part, did a really, really good job. They didn't, like, screw with anybody. They were pretty above board. You know, they did what cops and, and, and agents are supposed to do. They had a really high conviction rate, even for cases like this. This conviction rate was very, very high. They were very successful in their work. They felt incredibly proud of themselves. Um, there was nothing to save face from. I think they were worried I was more going to twist their words um, into something that they weren't um, or into into an argument that they ultimately would not support. I may have done that at the end of the day. Um, I may have told a story in which, and my goal actually was that to a degree, was to tell a story using the words of people on both sides of the issue. Um as a kind of platform, or it wasn't even a preconceived platform, it was just that I wanted to tell the story and see where it went, and where it went was there's just undeniably large flaws in our criminal justice system, and there's a way that cases like this, um, you know, they, um, they erode communities and community networks from the inside out, um, you know, inadvertently. You know, they don't do it on purpose. And that was very interesting to me. Um, one of you asked, Jenny asked, you know, what cultural phenomenon have I been interested in invest investigating? Um, are my areas of interest based in law? And the answer before this project was that no, you know, they really weren't based in law. Um, but this project made me, um, made me get involved with 
these issues. I've always been interested in the prison system. I've taught a class on prisons for many, many years, which I'm no longer able to teach because of my schedule. But that topic and 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 so forth has always been really important to me um, and very linked, obviously, to gangs. Um, but I never felt that I was capable or that it was my true gift to do any kind of advocacy work on behalf of legal reforms or policy reforms and it's actually still not my my if I have a gift it's that I'm a good ethnographer and I can tell stories and I think that some of these stories can lead into policy change so my goal is now to sort of work with um with with um with people who are whose gifts are policy and and legal uh, ref reforms and to sort of participate in whatever way I can as an ethnographer in those in those processes. Um, okay, so I'm hoping that I'm covering what I'm supposed to be covering a little bit of the backstory, um, more again of the backstory which so many of you guys asked about. Um, how, how it ended up happening. You know, when I first began this, my connection to Ben and his family was a very peripheral connection to this case. I mean, Ben was tried on a state charge, not a federal charge, and um, he was not one of the core players at all. I did not know the core players. I had never heard of them. I had no clue who they were. I didn't know they were all related to each other at the beginning of my research. And so... I ended up um, one day talking to Ben's girlfriend and saying, you know, these people are all the people from the villain's neighborhood that got targeted here. Do you know any of them? And she started to lay out all these interconnections for me, like so-and-so is the daughter. Tawana is the, the daughter of, of Charlotte Jackson and and and, and the, the daughter of, of John Edwards. I'm like, I didn't even know about that family connection when I first started. And then I started to delve into legal documents, the legal documents associated with the case. Um, and so I started reading all these, you know, these affidavits and, and transcriptions, wiretapping and all this stuff. Um, and so I became a lot more knowledgeable about the case itself and what the assertions were behind it. Um, and then gradually I got, I had, I constructed this, this letter and my God, when I think about it now, I would never do it now, and I would even expect my students like never to do something as stupid. But you know, and you'd think after 15 years of gang research or whatever I've been doing that I would have realized writing a really like detailed letter in really small font, you know, was really a dumb idea to a bunch of people who were in prison with like a survey attached to say, "Hey, I'm Susan Phillips." You know, some of you might know me as Cocaine, which is been my nickname in the Pueblos neighborhood for a long time and I that was like the only good thing I said in it but I ended up getting some responses and being becoming in touch with um with some of the people who were who were at the center of the case and the people who were at the center those people were the ones who responded to me so the first inter the first surveys and letters I got back were from Junior um and and Tawana father and daughter. And I didn't get one back from, from Tina. Um, and it was really funny because I couldn't remember if I had even sent something. I remember finding something in my car one time going, Oh my God, I never mailed this letter. I ended up writing Tina a second letter. And I said, you know, Tina, and, it, and again, this was like me being smart. I know you have a story to tell. And I, and I want to tell your story because I know there's a lot going on and there's a lot going on here and um, she wrote me back a beautiful letter and of course someone else had to write it for her because she is basically functionally illiterate she always has had to have people read my letters to her and write the responses because she she can't really do that kind of work on her own um, although I have to say since she's been in prison I think she has been able to make some progress in that regard in terms of her own literacy. Um, so I ended up getting surveys and, and starting like relationships with, with, with Tina and Junior. And then the other person that who came back to me um, was Juan Lococo. 
And he wrote me this letter that was just like, you know, eight pages long, alleging all these conspiracies in the case, you know, that the government had lied and, you know, he was just going on and on and on. Um, what ended up happening is that I ended up getting permission to interview Tina and and Tawana, who were both behind bars at FCI Dublin, which is the Federal Correctional Institution for Women. And uh, and then I ended up just getting a visiting form to go visit Juan Lococo. So I went and visited him. Uh, I took um, his, um, his mother and... Um, sister and their little girl um to the to the prison in victorville which is not far actually from where i teach um it's not it's a very southern southerly prison and so i ended up doing that um visiting inside a bit and and then simultaneous to that one of the questions of course i then asked people in correspondence was you know would you mind if i would you mind if i ask people in your family for interviews like would it be okay if I like interviewed your mom or somebody? And um, there was a slight domino effect when that started happening. So I got permission to, you know, call Miss Jackson. I got Miss Jackson's phone number, um, Tina's mom, and I interviewed Miss Jackson. She was just an incredible, incredible person, an incredible person to interview. Um, she was the one who first told me that three three women had died because of this case. And she just she she was just a fantastic person to talk to, um, and that was the, the the moment where you know this project because I think people perceived it as having, a, if if not a, a sort of change orientation like get the story out there and and see what happens, um, that that people started to call me so she ended up giving me uh, one of John's sister's phone numbers and then I got to interview, um, and then someone called me. A friend of of juniors called me to say, "Hey, I heard you're doing this project." And when that kind of stuff starts to happen when you're doing field work, it's like, my God, it's like golden. Um, it was really incredible stuff. Um, with um, K Rock in the book, um, he, I had talked to. Again, I had biases from my immersion in gangs, and from my friendship with Ben. And everybody knew who was a snitch. Like, everybody knew who were the people giving information. And they were like, and Ben was like, don't talk to this dude, don't talk to this dude, don't talk to this dude. And I was like, okay, yeah, I would never talk to those people. That's horrible what they did. Um, but then when I realized, okay, I got to take a step back here. And I started talking to the, aid, the FBI agent more. I started talking to Rob King a bit more. And I said, well, what about, you know, what about K-Rock? Like, what do you know? about him and of course they can't reveal that anybody has has given information and he said oh you he said oh you should contact him you know he said he, he I, he's a very talkative guy and when he said that you know a I knew of course he I already knew he'd given information but basically that was the agent's way of confirming it um, and and also that he would be willing to talk to me um, which in fact he was so we started up a correspondence I wrote him a letter and um, he was stationed way out in Florence, um, which is in Colorado. And it's, it's actually very famous as a federal correctional institution because there's a maximum security part of it is one of the kind of uh, best or worst, depending on how you think about it, uh, institutions that has a exclusive solitary confinement um, a housing unit, um, which is, is very questionable in terms of yeah, you know, basic human rights issues. Um, I tried to get a tour of it when I was there, but they were like, are you kidding me? You know, basically you have to be a senator to get a tour of, um, uh, uh, of, of the Florence facility. Um, so I flew to Florence, Colorado in the dead of winter. Um, I was just barely pregnant at the time. So I, and it was like snowing. <laughs> there were, I had rented a car at Colorado Springs. I drove to the facility. Um, I spent the night at like the Motel 6, you know, with all the other people who were going to be visiting inmates and stuff. And um, 
there was no way that you can, you know, I couldn't, with everyone, with all of the, the people in the book, I tried to get formal interviews with them. Um, the only place I was successful was FCI Dublin. The men's institutions absolutely refused to give me interviews. They refused to let me in. They said they don't have staffing to cover that and so forth. Um, so I don't know if it's a difference between men's institutions and women's or if it's just easier or whatever it is. But luckily I was able to get a visiting form and I was planning to go meet um, Kevin um, at the facility um, in Colorado. And uh, what ended up happening, it was the weirdest, weirdest thing where I, there I was like in Colorado Springs and then drove down to Florence, which is like this kind of deindustrial. It, it's like, it's like a, it's, it's not, it's like up in the mountains and it's sort of like, it, it's got two basic industries, one of which is antiquing and the other one is prisons. And it, everybody sort of works in those. And the reason the town is there is I think it's the Bakelite uh, factory that is there and remains there and was there. So there's like these, basically these three, this little triangulation of like antiquing prisons and the Bakelite factory. And it was just really a trip to be there. Um, so... That morning I went, I was really excited. I was going to get to talk to Kevin. You know, we had talked on the phone a ton. He's a really gregarious guy. And um, so I got there and they said, sorry, you know, the, the, the prison is on lockdown. It's going to be on lockdown the entire weekend. And I was like, really? You know, there's nothing I could do. I said, I bought a ticket out here. They said, sorry, that's just going to have to be your loss. So I was really upset and I... Um, you know, I called my friend and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm stuck here in Colorado. And she's like, are you kidding me? You know, you have a day to yourself. You know, so I went, I drove back to Colorado Springs. I went to the bookstore. I bought a book. I drove up the, oh God, what's the name of the mountain? Ah, oh, it's the Purple Mountain Majesty, I think, from the song. Um, anyway, I drove up high in the snow into this place and like had a hot chocolate and read my book all day. And, um... And just sort of thought about the project. And uh, and then when I came back, um, Kevin told me what had happened. And it's a really funny story, which is why I'm telling you. There's actually a reason why I'm telling you. It's because there had been an airing of the show from the History Channel called Gangland. And they um, they had shown the face of a guy who was from the Norteño gangs in California, um, which is like the northern Chicano gang grouping, um, that he had stabbed and killed a certain Sureño guy, which is the big southern, uh, southern Chicano gang division. And that guy from the Norteños happened to be at that prison in Florence, and nobody knew who it was until they saw his face on the screen during the airing of that episode. And when they showed his face on the screen, he was immediately attacked. Um, and then they had to lock everything down. And so it was just one of those weird moments where there was like a media intersection and, um, and, 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 and another frustration, you know, in terms of, of trying to get the project um, done. Now, what ended up happening with him was that he sent me part of an autobiography that he was working on. So he he sent this autobiography to me, and it had a it had some of the stories in it that I ended up telling in the book. So I got his permission to sort of say, "Hey, do you mind if I if I like adapt some of this stuff about your early life, etc.?" You know, and we were talking on the phone a lot at that point. Um, um, and so that's what ended up making, I think the, the, the part about, about him, um, so rich. Uh, the other thing that makes it really rich is, um, you know, a lot of you guys had questions about snitching. Um, I think what makes that part important about the book is it just shows one individual's transformation um, from a person who would have sort of vilified snitching and classed it and, you know, these extremely, um, 
you know, horrible possibilities of like being either an informer or a homosexual, like that no one can envision anything absolutely worse than that um, in the gang world. Um, and what ended up happening with him is that you begin to see how it makes sense for him and you begin and he begins to see how it makes sense for him and even at the time when I was writing the book um, it didn't make as much sense he was still in a very conflicted place about having given information um, he still felt a lot of the pulls of and the tugs of gang identity um, and now I can honestly say he's out I've seen him on the outside um, he has um, a new baby um, he has no interest in being like a gang guy anymore. Um, and actually Tawana just had a baby as well. So I've pretty much stayed in touch with everybody. Um, that was another question that, um, you guys had. Um, did I stay in touch with people? Um, Jessica asked, um, did I keep in touch with the, any of the criminals in, in the book and um, I have stayed in touch with everyone actually so um, you know I get Christmas cards from John Edwards he's always saying like the Lord will bless me and and all this stuff um, and and Tina and I stay in pretty close contact um, T Tawana is out you know she has this new baby who's nine months old now very sweet little guy um, she's really really struggling um, there's a lot of stuff I didn't write about in the book, um, um, and it, it's it's hard, you know, when you do stuff like this, it's about making choices, but also there's just stuff that's happened in the meantime that, you know, that I, there's modes of analysis that I hadn't thought of, you know, there's ways of analyzing violence that I hadn't thought of. At the time, I hadn't done certain kinds of analyses that I didn't realize were relevant, and I've done them subsequently. Um, um, there's different media um, analyses that I that I did in the book when I was talking about, you know, the sort of duality of, of you know, the cop. Here's the cop version, and here's the target version of what's happening on the ground, and it it turns out there's some really interesting stuff um, that I still need to sort of publish and think about in terms of what this um, book is and what it has to offer. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so I, I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to tell you about. Um, so Kira and um, Jessica asked me, like, how my opinions have changed since writing this book, maybe how my life has changed. Um, and, the, I mean, the issue for me is that, you know, this book did change my life, but it also wasn't as hard as the my previous research. So, like, my, um, my relationship with Ben and his family and, like, the time when I was really involved in being in the field and, like, hanging out in the projects and... Um, all of the sort of complications of race and class and my own positionality um, were not as were not as as evident in this book. They weren't as much part of my experience, and I haven't fully um, processed my major field work in the Pueblo del Rio housing projects. I haven't written that book yet and I may write it and I may not I'm not sure um, I think I probably will write it um, but what this book did for me I think is it made me more mature it made me more mature as a writer I mean certainly if you compare it to my first book which was I think fairly disastrous in terms of writing this book I hope that Paul here agrees being the ready or not writing guy that he is um, but I think this book is pretty well written I hope it is and I really worked hard as a writer to sort of try to balance the different um, elements of it you know not to sacrifice contextualization but to tell a story at the same time and to tell different kinds of stories that were linked to different social justice issues 
Um, so that was my goal, and I think I did manage to do it. And the best thing for me about this book has been that everybody on both sides of the case has read it. So they read it before it was published. Like, I gave it to everybody to give me feedback on, basically. I was like, does this seem right to you, you know? And that was the most gratifying thing when Mark Brooks, after he read the entire manuscript, called me and said, you got it 99% right. And he goes, you're really smart. And I was just like, it took him reading the entire thing for him to realize that I actually do know what's going on down there, as he would say. So it was just a funny, uh, that was a very, very gratifying moment for me. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to say is that the best thing in terms of my experience has been that, um, you know, everybody on both sides of the book read it, meaning the law enforcement people read it and the targets and their families read it, and everybody likes it. Everybody liked it. Everybody thought it was right and true to them. And I don't really subscribe to one, you know, a single notion of truth. I mean, I have a kind of sort of anti-positivist way in terms of thinking about people's stories and how they intermesh and how we create multiple interpretations depending on where we sit of what exists as objective reality. Um, but the fact that people felt it was true to their heart, um, subjectively true for them, meant a lot for me because that was one of the goals that I had as a writer and as an ethnographer in this book, which was to take... Um, to take it as it, you know, to take people where they sat and to really talk about what was at stake for them. Um, so that's kind of it. I can't, I don't think I can pause this thing. <coughs> Unfortunately, I don't know a lot about the program that I'm using here. Um, oops. And I certainly hope that um, I've done an okay job of not creating an overly boring presentation. I guess sitting at a desk and it's not that interactive with you guys um, is a little bit uh, tricky. Um, but I hope that, it, you know, it's answered some of your questions. Um, let's see. Oh, I, I guess I can also tell you what's happening with Tina and Junior. So, here, here's another thing I was unaware of, um, just to bring you up to speed on like what happened with the people, because when the book was written, it was written in the sense that everybody, even in 2003, knew that the crack versus cocaine sentencing disparity was not, was going to be demolished. Like they knew that it was not going to last. By the time this case rolled around, it was almost like a prep case for like how to move beyond that, even though the people in the book are sentenced under the old laws. So Juan Lococo, Junior, Tina, um, K-Rock, everybody was sentenced under the 100 to 1. And I, and I know that you read the book, and so you know uh, the part about how they... Um, you know, they, they maximize their sense even for the people who were dealing in powder by saying it was, it should be considered crack because of conspiracy and because the definition of conspiracy, uh, it, you don't really have to bring your crime to fruition and you don't have to have hard evidence. You just have to, you just have to kind of prove that the person knows that something's going to happen. And, um, and so they were all sentenced to these massive sentences, you know, Junior got 27 years, Tina got 25 Juan Lococo got um, 22 years. He he actually won an appeal, which I reference in the intro, which, you know, he was just adamant about saying, I didn't know they were going to turn it into crack. And he just said that over and over again. And so they finally said, okay, you didn't know they were going to turn it into crack. And they lessened his sentence. He's about to get out. He'll get out in the next year or two. Um, with Junior and Tina, they were both... <sighs> It, it, it was a strange, it was a strange thing. Junior will probably, okay, so in 2010, Obama signed into, to, to, uh, into law the Fair Sentencing Act, 
which rectified the disparity to a, to a degree, made it 18 to 1. So that's in the introduction, too. And then the, the conclusion of the book says, you know, here's Junior and Tina, you know, basically waiting to see if the, the, the law was made retroactive, waiting to see if the retroactivity would apply to them. And it turns out that it probably will apply to Junior, but it will not apply to Tina. Um, and the reason for that is very disturbing to me. Um, it's because, and I have to check this paperwork because I don't have this paperwork for some reason in my files. I actually have to go down to the courthouse and get her sentencing agreement. Um, according to her lawyers, they're saying she was sentenced as a career offender. And um, the career offender designation basically means you're sentenced in another part of the guidelines and in another part of the guidelines that's not touched by the crack reform retroactivity. It's not touched by crack reform at all. Um, a career offender designation is basically the federal equivalent of the three strikes law. Um, and, and there's two ways that you can get to career offender status. One of them is through violence. So if you commit three felonies, federal you know, felonies that are violent in nature, you will be designated as a career offender. Um, the other way is through drugs. And this is another example of how the federal system has prioritized a war on drugs by making it equivalent in the eyes of the law to crimes of violence. So if you commit two or more drug felonies, and again, these actually don't, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke before, they don't have to be federal felonies. They just have to, your whatever you're being tried for, usually the third one, is a federal crime of some kind. Um, if you have two previous crimes of violence tried at the state level, as most crimes of violence are, those will qualify you. Same thing with drugs. So Tina had two or more previous uh, felonies that were drug related, and so she, um, she ended up um, um, she, she, she ended up being designated as a career offender. That means that, that she didn't even know it, you know? I didn't even know it. Honestly, I was extremely surprised. I don't, I, I don't know why. And in fact, there's a possibility that it's not true. So we have to really delve into it to figure out what is happening. With her, though, her career offender status is intimately linked to the fact that she's a mentally ill person and that she's been using drugs to self-medicate for many, many years. Um, and so that is, to me, a legal argument that can be made. And it also made me wonder how many other people who are designated as career offenders qualify as mentally ill because of this connection that we have between our prisons and mental illness. And of course, I'm, I'm telling you all this in the wake of this, these shootings on Friday and the sort of resurgence of interest in treatment of mentally ill people um, even in wealthy communities, in communities that don't have means, you know, you're not going to wind up, you're going to wind up in prison. He, you know, that person would have been in prison uh, long before a uh, shooting of this nature uh, would have taken place. That's the, the trick of the whole thing. So this, this linkage between mental illness and, and, um, and drug use. And so she's in for 25 years, and um, I, I think she's slated actually to come out in 2025. Um, and, and Junior, I'm not sure what will happen, because before the judge said he was reluctant to give Junior a case at less time than, than, than Tina, um, they were both sitting at, last time I checked, at 25 years. I'm sorry, getting out in, in 2025, which is 25 years from when they were sentenced. Actually, that math doesn't work. Um, anyway, so the, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of update on where people are at. Um, you know, I, I have them in my life now. They're, they're part of my life. Um, I never promised anything out of the book. Except I said, you know, if if I make any money with this book, I'll I'll use part of it to support you guys as you're doing your 25 years, and I don't I don't know how clear I made it in the book, but it's really expensive for people to be in prison. It's expensive for their families, and I thought, my God, if 
if there's anything that I can do um, to alleviate some of that through the writing of this, then that's what I would do. And um, and so, yeah, I've certainly given away far more money to them than I've received because I haven't hardly made anything from the book. Um, and, yeah, it's Christmas time, you know, so people people are thinking about each other at this time. And I think I end the book with this whole idea of what it means to celebrate a new year when you're in prison. And it's just really complicated. Um, it's a complicated story. It's a story that... You know, I didn't tell a lot of it. I didn't tell my part in it, really. I didn't want to, because I felt I did too much of that in my first book. Um, and I think that now I'm really ready to go full circle and write a book that's not so naively revealing as my first one and not so sort of distant as the second one is. I mean, I, I think I'm passionate enough about the issues as a writer, but I certainly don't put in... Any, I did. I did not make myself uh, a character in the book. I could have been one, but I didn't want to go there. Um, so we'll see what happens. Anyway, I hope that I addressed the questions that you had. Um, you know, I really appreciated the time that you put in to reading the book, um, and I'm pretty sure that most of the questions that you had are related to my you know, decision not to put myself as a character in the book. I just didn't reveal a lot about the process. And so I actually really appreciate having a chance to talk about it with you guys. Um, and I'll look forward to um, hearing whatever responses you have. And I wish you the best of luck on your finals as well. Okay? Um, and have a good um, holiday break from your schooling. Okay, thanks so much. Bye.